this video we're going to talk about the conduction rate equation or Fourier's law. We talked a little bit about it in the last video and you read about it in chapter 1.2 section 1 but we're going to look at it a little more closely in chapter 2.1. Remember that most heat transfer is multi-dimensional so what we have here is a body in which there's a temperature gradient in two directions. Let's define a coordinate system. So now we can say that there's a temperature gradient in the X and the Y direction. The temperature gradient is indicated by the colors here. Those little white arrows are indicating the direction of heat transfer. They are the heat flux vectors across the medium. Note that each one of those vectors are perpendicular to the local isotherm, local meaning at a particular X and Y coordinate. The bigger or longer the arrow indicates a bigger heat flux vector. On the left, where you see those red, orange, and yellowish bands, you can see that temperature is changing more across a shorter distance. If you think back to Fourier's law, you might be able to see why that is. Um, now, because this is two-dimensional heat transfer, we have to define the heat flux in the x and y direction. Note that the units are watts per meter squared. If we had three-dimensional heat transfer, we'd need to account for another term to account for the heat flux in the Z direction. You could also put things in terms of heat transfer rates and that would just be in terms of watts. We've mentioned that most heat transfer is multi-dimensional, but we can often approximate it as one dimensional. So when can we make the approximation that heat transfer is one dimensional? When the temperature only changes in one direction. For example, heat transfer through a window or wall of a house is approximately one dimensional since the temperature gradient will only be changing from the interior, interior to the exterior. Now, of course, you'll have multidimensional effects towards the edges and the corners, but as a whole, the temperature changes in only one direction. Another example is if you have fluid flowing through a pipe. Say the fluid is cold and the environment around the pipe is hot. The temperature gradient will only be in the radial direction. So if I can assume the heat transfer is only in one direction, then we only need to consider the X component of Q, the rate or the heat flux. Now, as we mentioned in video 1.1 through 1.3, conduction is the transfer of thermal energy from more to less energetic molecules due to collision and diffusion of molecules. It involves stationary or stationary fluids or solids. We can use Fourier's law to describe the rate of heat transfer by conduction. Looking at the conduction in the x direction, we have Qx. So let's look at a wall. The left side is hot at T1, the right side is colder at T2. Next, we'll define a coordinate system. Since there are two isotherms, one at x0 and one at xl, uh, or x equals l, uh, the heat transfer vector is normal to each of these and q will point in the, into the right in the direction of decreasing temperature. Now this wall has a certain thermal conductivity and a cross-sectional area through which the heat transfer vector flows perpendicularly. I could also define Fourier's law in terms of conductive heat flux, which would be Q divided by the area A. Now let's look at the different parts of this equation. Once again, we notice that we're defining this heat transfer rate in terms of the X direction. Now let's look at K. K is the thermal conductivity of, of the material. Figure 2.4 in your book shows you the range that you might expect of thermal conductivity for different substances. Note that the thermal conductivity goes from 0 0.01 to 1000 watts per meter Kelvin. You can look up the thermal conductivity for different materials in table A.1 through A.7 in the back of your book. You can see that K is a function of material, the phase, solid, liquid, or gas, and the temperature. In general, as the molecules get closer together, thermal conductivity increases. It doesn't always work that way, but it's a good rule of thumb. Now let's look at the area. Always keep in mind that the heat transfer vector is perpendicular to the isotherm. The area of the face indicated at x equals l is at a uniform temperature of T2. 
the area at the face indicated at x equals 1 is at a uniform temperature of T1. The area is the area that is normal to the heat transfer vector. Now we come to the temperature gradient dt dx. To evaluate this, we need to know a few things. The temperature profile, T is a function of x, or some boundary condition. Remember video 1.1 through 1.3, we said that if the heat transfer were one dimensional and steady state, we could say that Q is equal to negative Ka times T2 minus T1 divided by L. Well, now we're going to show you why that's the case. If the heat transfer rate, the thermal conductivity, and the surface area are constant, dt over dx is constant as well. Let's call that constant C1. If we bring the dx over to the right and integrate, we get that t as a function of x is equal to C1x plus C2. We have two unknowns, so we need two boundary conditions, and we happen to have a prescribed temperature at two surfaces. The first boundary condition is at x equals 0, and the second is at x equals L. Substituting the first boundary condition into the equation for Tx, we can solve for C2, and it's equal to T1. Substituting the second boundary equation into the equation for Tx at x equals L, we can solve for C1. And plugging those values for C1 and C2 in, we have an expression for T as a function of x. We also have an equation for dt over dx, which verifies Fourier's law for 1D steady state heat transfer that we had before. And note, because dt over dx is a constant, the slope is constant and t as a function of x is linearly distributed. The last thing we need to note is the negative sign. Since T2 is less than T1, in this case, the negative sign of dt over dx, T2 minus T1 over L, in this case, ensures that Q will be a positive quantity. Finally, we see the general trend is that for conduction, Q increases as K increases, uh, surface area increases, the temperature difference increases, and the thickness of that material increases. All right, well, that's all we have for today. Um, thank you for watching, and let me know if you have any questions.